And the recording has started. Cool. So welcome everyone to sales enablement uh, for uh, Thursday, March 21st. Um, I'm Dan Gordon, Technical Marketing. Uh, and we're going to today, for the most part, be covering uh, a review of a click-through demo that is available to show um, GitLab uh, across all of its capabilities uh, using the Auto DevOps feature um, as, as the focus. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we're going to have uh, Tina hop on real quick and, and what you're looking at. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some events that we have coming up that we're pretty excited about and we'd like you guys to, uh, to check out and help us out with. So, Tina? Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, I will not take too long today. Uh, for all that know me or don't know me, I'm Tina Sturgis, Partner Marketing. Um, I wanted to enforce and reiterate, because I'm sure you have heard from your field marketing team already, that we have Google ne Next coming up in just over two weeks, um, starting on April 9th. Uh, we have a, a, a big sponsorship there. A um, couple things I wanted to show you. Um, we do have an Epic here uh, within our GetLab system. That's what you're looking at here. The Epic has, if you're interested in uh, providing your customers or your prospects a discount code, please go there. The discount code is there. It gives them $400 off. Uh, from the uh, full rate. Um, so please take advantage of that. It looks like we have up to a hundred um, discount codes to leverage uh, for that. Moving on. So what does it mean for us at um, you know, Google Next and how can you in field sales help us? So we have two main areas that I need your help in and we are urging you um, to do that, which is we have a conference dinner uh, that we are sponsoring on Tuesday, April 9th. It's in the evening at seven o'clock. We have rented out to the entire uh, Fang restaurant, as you can see here in the location. We have a maximum capacity of 60 people. I would love if you guys can help us fill the place completely full um, without all GitLabbers or Googlers. Um, so at the end of the day, um, I think that you know if you need help, um, there is um, information in the issues on how to invite uh, within the planning doc is once you get the people to actually uh, be invited, uh, you'll go to the planning doc like you normally do with any other event. You'll update the specific tab and then Emily Lures will take that to the next level and make sure that they have a formal invite. The other area that I um, strongly need your help here is uh, Google Next meetings. So these are our on-site meetings with leadership and executives. Um, again, this is something that we have a, a ton of different um, executives and leadership. Uh, I think we have Eric Johnson is going from the engineering team. We have Brandon Young on the alliances team. Sid will come in if we can book some meetings. Uh, we also have Todd Barr. We have a ton of people going to this event and I'd love to get their, their calendars packed with customers and prospects from your side. Again, this isn't any different than we do it before. The planning doc has all of the information for you. Um, we, we are meeting at a particular location. It will not be on site at the event itself. We actually have a meeting room at the St. Regis Hotel, which is just across the street from where we're at in the Moscone Center. So um, we are putting together some documents in addition to the documents that you see here to help you do email invites, et cetera. Uh, so those will be forthcoming as well. And I did want to tell you one thing. So those are the two things that I have the needs for. So the dinner and uh, the meetings on site with leadership. Um, I also want to tell you we're trying something new this time at the booth. So instead of giving big giveaways at the booth itself, um, we're actually going to do a larger giveaway or raffle for an iPad. So anyone who comes to the booth can get a, um, an iPad. Uh, I think we're giving away one of those. Um, and then what we're doing is we're taking, if you look here for the badge scan, we're going to donate five to $10 on behalf of the person uh, to a designated charity. So I think that this is a, a super fun way to get people excited. I think that it'll actually create a buzz. Love the fact that Emily, Kyle, and the team has put this together because it's very different. And, you know, being the, the charitable person that I am, I would 100% hands down go to that booth um, 
to, to give to my uh, charity of choice. I don't think we have the specifics of the designated charity yet, uh, but we will um, definitely let you all know. So that's definitely a fun thing on Google Next. I'm done, so I am going to stop my share, Dan, and I'm gonna pass it over to you for your regularly scheduled thing. Thank you very much. Cool, lots of exciting stuff. I love the charity idea, that is super cool. Um, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut over and take a look at, I'm gonna show my desktop here. Uh, we're gonna take a look at one of the available demos that you can do at the booth, or if you're sitting with a customer, um, I think uh, Hayden's had the experience at one point where he was just chatting on the side with someone he met at a conference and maybe it was on a plane, I don't remember Hayden, and you're able to pull this demo out and kind of show them some of GitLab and what it could do and they were like, wow, all right, let's talk. Um, so I'm gonna go through that demo um, or one of those demos. Uh, I'm starting here on, actually, I'm not, I'm not gonna start there. I'm gonna start here, which is nowhere. Uh, you can find this by doing a search for GitLab demos. And the first non-commercial link that pops up is demos at GitLab. And that is our marketing page that has all of these demos. It has lots of videos, um, overview information, et cetera, and what we call the click-through demos. And that's what we're focusing on today. These click-through demos, there's uh, one that's new for secure capabilities, which uh, I will cover in a future training uh, enablement. Uh, there is a auto DevOps run. Uh, which is the full version of what we're going to cover today. This auto DevOps run takes you through from planning all the way through, a little bit of planning, all the way through uh, to, uh, to monitoring uh, and goes into details on each of those steps. But if you don't want to do that whole 18, 20 minute demo, there's also a, uh, there's also setting up of GKE and whatnot, but there's also a auto DevOps run short. And that's what we're going to look at today. You can actually run it straight from here. Uh, Without, uh, without downloading anything. Um, you can jump around, et cetera. Uh, but you can also get the actual file uh, and you can cache that locally. And that's what I've done over here. So here I'm sitting with, uh, with the Auto DevOps Run. I've got it cached locally so I can be doing this disconnected. And we're gonna hop into that and I'm gonna walk you through that. I'm gonna go a little bit fast through it. So I'm gonna talk kind of quickly. Uh, just in the interest of time, so there's time for questions at the end. This should run, uh, depending on how much you talk and how fast you talk, anywhere between six to 10 minutes. So we'll hop into that. <clears throat> so this is a, a view of, uh, of a feature, a capability in GitLab called Auto DevOps. We show this because it, is, it does a good job of showing across uh, all the different stages and many of the different stages. We're going to start by talking about the complexity of tool chains, which poses a challenge uh, when uh, companies are trying to achieve DevOps or to basically uh, DevOps or not deliver value to their customers more quickly. Uh, they start putting together lots of different pieces from uh, uh, lots of different point tools to make up their pipeline, their delivery pipeline. And there's lots of conflicts and there's lots of integration work that needs to be done. And what we find is that uh, companies get bogged down and they don't achieve the value of delivering uh, value to their customers quickly uh, because they're busy setting up their tool chain. GitLab, by contrast, has capabilities across the entire tool chain, uh, um, all the way from managing to, uh, to, to monitoring and, and soon defending. Uh, and all of this is in one tool, all pre-integrated, ready to go. Uh, so you can put down GitLab, put your code in, and, and start deploying your application into production. Now, I'm gonna pause here just for a second uh, to point out something here. Uh, I have set this up so that there are, um, uh, there are flag points along the way, like create, and this is a change since a uh, previous use that, I, that I've uh, gotten feedback on, uh, et cetera, so that you can jump to certain points if you need to. Try not to do this because we kind of want to tell a story. It's not about just showing features. It's about telling a story. However, if someone comes in and says, hey, show me what you got on monitoring, right? Uh, if there's a dot hidden next to it, like under create, verify, secure, release, configure, and monitor, then uh, while the slideshow is running, a click on one of those will jump you to that point. So I can jump to monitoring, for example, and I can go from there. Getting back is a little bit more difficult. So we're back here. Uh, you've just talked about uh, how GitLab has capabilities across the, uh, you know, the whole development uh, life cycle, DevSecOps life cycle. And we're gonna talk about auto DevOps. And so this is gonna focus on uh, this orange bar here. It covers from create through monitor. 
So what Auto DevOps does is it sets it up so that you have an out-of-the-box pipeline that's ready to go that does a whole bunch of, of, um, of verification and validation and packaging and deploying for you so that as a developer, you can just commit and GitLab Auto DevOps will take care of the rest. And start with create. Uh, we're going to uh, start here and I'm going to point out that this is just source code and maybe some project files. There's no pipeline file. There's no Docker file to define how we want to do anything with the source code. Um, but let's go ahead and pop in and do a quick edit uh, on the hello controller.java. We're going to do that in our built in web IDE uh, because that web IDE enables you to do everything without having to configure your local environment. Uh, it's all it's all in, in the cloud or all on the system all through the web. So I'm going to make some changes here to the background uh, color. I'm going to take out this to do message, uh, which is a comment. I'm going to change the message uh, to something like GitLab uh, and then uh, actually add a logo, but let's go ahead and make the commit on these changes. And we can see automatically it shows us the diffs here. Um, so we can do a quick check and make sure that this is what we want. Part of the value of the web IDE is I can pick which files I've changed that I want to commit. So much like Git on the command line, except it is a visual, uh, I can uh, be very selective about what I want to push forward. So I'm going ahead and select the file I changed, add a quick message, uh, and then I'm going to commit that. Before I do, I need to decide, do I want this to commit straight to our master branch, which is not a best practice, uh, or do I want GitLab to take care of some things for me? Uh, I'm going to have select down here to have it create a branch and a merge request. Now, this is a best practice so that uh, GitLab will automatically put my changes into a separate branch so that I'm not affecting what everyone else is using. And it's going to start what we call a merge request once I do the commit. And this merge request is the centerpiece around where we capture the results and all the information about the change that we're making. So this is also where the discussions will take place and approvals so we'll be, that will help us to decide whether or not this change is, is uh, verified and validated to go forward into production. Uh, one of the things I'll check on this uh, with all these settings is to have it remove the source code branch after it's been merged. So because it's a whole connected system, we have this ability out of the box. Once this is merged into production, GitLab will go back. It will clean up the, the extra branch that was created. It will actually go and clean up the Kubernetes uh, review apps uh, and make sure that you're not wasting resources on that anymore. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so a lot of great things come out of that single, single checkbox to keep your repository and your system clean. Then I'll go ahead and submit the merge request. And this is going to take us to the verify and secure stage where, uh, where we're going to look at uh, the pipeline. If the pipeline gets kicked off, Here's the merge request, and you can see that it's already identified the pipeline. It's created it, and it's put it up here so I can start tracking it from this point. And you, we'll see that this gets filled out with more information in a little bit. Um, remember, again, that as I as we take a look at this pipeline, it's doing all of this. We haven't defined anything. This is all out of the box capability. You can automate uh, or customize the pipeline. Uh, you can create your own pipeline to do whatever build you want on your own, uh, but this is uh, this is what comes out of the box. So Auto DevOps will detect your language and it will uh, do a build on it and create an appropriate Docker image. That is all uh, the process of figuring that out and doing that is automated. Once it's done that, it's going to kick off a series of tests. There's six in a row here that are going to run in parallel. We'll scale out to do that. Um, and those tests are the code quality checks. Again, remember, this is all part of GitLab, so we didn't add or connect or integrate to anything. Uh, this is all built in code quality checks. We're going to do container scanning. So we're going to look at the image that we, that we placed our app in because the container is our application environment. And we want to make sure that that is secure, not just our code. So we're going to scan for vulnerabilities in the container image. We're going to do dependency scanning, which is going to look at all of the software that our software uses, all the dependencies. And it's going to check all of that uh, for vulnerabilities as well so that we're checking not just our code, but everything else as well. Uh, it's going to do license checks. Oops, sorry. It's going to do license checks where it's going to look again at all of the code that all of the uh, code that our code is using. It's going to check the licenses that those code uses so we don't accidentally do something like adopt a uh, a viral uh, open source license that makes, uh, for example, that means we have to now give our code away for free and that anyone else can use it. If we don't want that as a business, we can set up a policy against that and license uh, scanning will we'll catch that and flag it. Uh, and then we're also going to do static application security testing, SAST. And what that's doing is that's looking through our code for known vulnerabilities, things like buffer overflows and things that we can catch by looking at code. And it's going to flag those so those can be fixed and not passed into, uh, into a production environment. We're also going to then do uh, the developer tests. 
So these are any tests that the developer defines, unit tests, functional tests. Those can be put into the code base. Uh, our Heroku build packs will find that, GitLab will find that, look at those and then run the appropriate tests. Once it's done all of those tests, it's gonna move on to, uh, to the review app. And now the review app is a little bit of magic here where GitLab and Kubernetes together are gonna work to take that, uh, Take that change, uh, uh, that uh, sorry, that um, that build artifact that has the uh, all of the tested and verified code, and it's going to put it into an environment that's up and running, that's specific for this change. So we haven't pushed back anything to the master branch or the default branch. This is just each developer's code change now running as a live application, so that the developer can interact with it, stakeholders can interact with it, and verify that the changes are correct as well as this enables us to do things like dynamic application security testing. So DAS is going to look for things like uh, cross-site scripting and other vulnerabilities that you can't find by just looking at the pieces of code, but you have to find looking at everything together running. Uh, so we're able to do that, again, on each developer change because we have this environment automatically set up. Another thing we can do because of that is performance testing. So we're going to run SiteSpeed.io and check on stats and baseline and then and measure against that baseline for did this change actually create uh, a slower um, interface for the user? So what is the user experience after this change has been made? So lots of great data, um, lots of tests, but it would be not great if you had to go back and dig into each of those jobs to find the information. So if we want to review that, one of the beauties is it all comes back to that merge request again. So this was the pipeline, the merge request. Remember we had the pipeline here and we still have a summary of it. We've now got uh, the link to the review app. So I can go to the review app and see, yep, those are our changes. They look good. Uh, I can get, I can look at the measurements uh, on, on memory usage, on code quality reports. So it found that I made that change there um, and performance results. Uh, I can get all from here, the information on the security tests. Uh, and so I can see here that it found a vulnerability. I can actually click into that, get more information about the vulnerability, create an issue on it, um, uh, dismiss it so I can take action from, from here for that. Uh, and then once I'm past all of these and I've verified, and let's say that I'm good with the results uh, and, and whoever is, uh, is an improver is allowed to say, you know, who's allowed to, to, to merge, can go ahead and then say merge the code. Now, once that merge happens, we're kind of moving into our release phase. And let's go ahead and uh, we can see that in the pipeline screen that, that that actually kicks off a new pipeline. So let's take a look at that new pipeline. Looks pretty much the same. It's doing a lot of the same tests, except now instead of going into a review app, we're going straight to production. Um, now, uh, that's kind of continuous deployment at its best. We've made some code changes. We sent it through the pipeline that got validated uh, and then uh, it, it was merged in and then went all the way through to production. Now, uh, let's take a look at a result. Once that's pushed to production, we have our production environment that we're tracking. We can see the changes and the commits that have happened to, to that production environment. I can also go to the live environment and I can see again that same code, but now it's actually in the live environment. I can also drop down here and get more information about uh, the scale of our application. So I can see here that there's a single pod, Kubernetes pod that's running uh, our application. So maybe I'm not good with that. Okay, that was good for the getting it out there, but I'm expecting a load on this. So we're gonna go ahead and increase it. I can go into settings. I can define the number of replicas I want, save that variable, I've set it to five, and then redeploy. And once it redeploys, it's gonna go ahead live, start showing me as it builds out and then starts filling out those extra pods until I get to the uh, stability point where I've reached the desired number of pods and I can see that in my interface. But that's not all, we also monitor. So this application, remember I didn't set up or configure any of this, but we deployed it through GitLab, so automatically it's now set up for Prometheus monitoring. So we can go here from uh, the environment and we can take a look at the app itself and see uh, the monitoring information about it. Out of the box, we're getting uh, information from the uh, Ingress uh, proxy about HTTP error rate, latency, uh, the throughput uh, stats. I can also get information about the Kubernetes cluster, the infrastructure that I'm running on, uh, pod average uh, um, for CPU and memory usage, et cetera. And I've also got these lines. Now these lines are important because this is really cool. We're actually correlating the deployments that we've made to the behavior that we've monitored. So 
I can dig into this line and I can see, okay, so this was deployed, there was a deployment that happened at this point, right? I had a memory uh, uh, kick up of all of a sudden. So I can go and I can actually look and get the details about what that change was, who made it, when it was made, so that I can take action or, or investigate more. I'll hop back to monitoring. Uh, and then finally, uh, let's say that I'm, I'm not comfortable as a customer. I don't really want to go straight into deployment, uh, it, it, straight into production as I, uh, as I uh, get my tests done. That's not a problem. That's the default mode that we have it set to. But you can also configure manual rollout by going to, uh, to the CICD settings for Auto DevOps uh, and then simply checking uh, to have manual deployment done to production instead. Once you do that, we'll go ahead and run a new pipeline against master because that's what actually sends us to production. What we'll see is that we get a similar pipeline, but now it's going to staging. It's going to stop and wait and let us look at that and then allow uh, whoever has the access to roll out incrementally uh, 10, 25, 50, 100 into production. And that is, in a short nutshell, um, uh, auto DevOps functionality, but showing capabilities across all of GitLab. Okay. We're going to stop and check for questions. Oops, hold on. Let me uh, stop the recording.